High fives. Good job, man. <laughs> What's going on? Welcome back to our Friday night seminars right here at Lake Fork Marina. Tonight we're going to talk to you about offshore fishing. It's summertime. We're going to talk about how to fish brush piles with big ribbon tail worms. We're also going to talk about how to fish humps and ledges with shaky heads in tonight's episode. We want to thank each and every one of you that's here in person so very much and all of you watching behind the camera as well. We got my man Cody Mays. What's up, brother? In the casa. That's it. Que paso, amigo. Glad to have you. Glad to have me. <laughs> I know, because you were hosted last week. That's I wasn't right. here. That's, That's right, two right. weeks ago. That's right, I wasn't here. <laughs> and I just want to point out that I haven't worn camo shorts since I got roasted for them in the last seminar a little bit, but I wore them tonight just for Zach, and then Zach didn't even show up. But, you know, but you're missing the white holy shirt, though. I have holes in my white shirts? Yeah. yeah. I've never even seen the holes in them. <laughs> I don't even know which one, I guess. I mean, I've been wearing them fishing for like four years. So I guess they're pretty good shirts. Yeah. Lucky shirts. Yeah, they got a lot of fish slime that's on them. That's, that's right. About. They smell perfect that's at right. this point. We just just broke in, as they say, right? Just yeah. broke in. I have some of those myself. Well, it has begun to get hot. I mean, this has been the strangest year fishing conditions wise. We, we had the big freeze in February, and then we kind of recovered quick from that with 80 degree temps the next week in February, which was odd in itself. But then throughout March, April, and even really May, we never really warmed up. The water temps were behind the normals for all three of those springtime prime months that we normally fish. And then we break into June, and about the second to third week of June, we went from early May water temperatures to late July water temperatures. And I don't know, yeah, get that man a chair. There you go. He's got the right hat on. You better get that man a chair. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. He's got the right hat on, and he's got one of the mixing drink cups in his hand. I like this guy. I like this guy. That's my guy. Hey, right, we can hang out when this is done, me and you, buddy. Huh? That's the wrong hat. That ain't no six cents Lake Fork hat. That's old Ketchum hat. All right. All right. But it's been a really extreme change that has taken place, and a lot of it took place while I was gone last week to the Bassmaster Classic in Fort Worth at Lake Ray Roberts. And I was over there thinking while I was there, I was like, boy, I bet it's going down offshore on Lake Fork right now because it, it finally got hot. It but, changed 12 degrees since last week. Oh, it's changed more than that since so. I don't mean to contradict you, but in certain areas it's changed more than that. I bet. Um, when I, I left here, I, I left last Wednesday, a week, so a week and a half ago I left. I got back here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday today. I've been fishing out every day this week. When I was out here Tuesday and Wednesday, I was finding water temps as high as 93 and 94 in the right areas. So we went, and but before I left a week ago Wednesday, we were at 75 to 78, depending on what part of the lake you were in. Man, that's a almost 20 degree switch. Yeah, that's crazy. Oh, oh, oh. True. Uh oh. <laughs> Hope I ain't got no warrants. The law is here. We got our we got our state trooper Nick Moore in the house. Good to see you again, brother. But a 15 degree change in a week or less. That's about as extreme as it gets when you're talking about 27, 28,000 acres of water. Like guys, that doesn't happen 15 degrees in a week. And even the main lake has changed over 10 degrees in, a, in less than a week and it, it continues to climb so now we're even we're to the point now where the main lake is close to 90 88 89 90. does anybody realize that like last year we never even got the main lake water temps above 90 at all last year now in, in hot years normal hot years in texas we'll get to 91 92 93 that's it that's as hot as lake fort gets and we're there now after we were at 70 something a couple weeks ago. We went from late April, early May water temps to July, August water temps in a week. That is a huge change for the fish. So the fishing has changed dynamically uh, on this lake. A and now we've gone from being behind to being ahead is what I would call it. We kind of missed our whole May, early June bite. That's kind of, that, that all happened in the span of a few days, really, as far as those conditions that you want to fish in May and early June, which, by the way, is the best time of year to go catch numbers of good quality fish out here every year. So it kind of stinks that we got that window so tight this year, just a few days of it. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. And what most people don't realize, and I think because typically as fishermen, man, we fish a lot in the springtime, we fish a lot in the early summer, then by the time we get to the J July and August, the dog days, 
just from my experience being out here on the pond, a lot of people back off just because of how uncomfortable it is. They start having a tougher time catching them, whatever. You just don't get as many people fishing in July and August. That's a mistake because what happens is the more extreme the weather gets, the more grouped up the fish get. So the, the more desperate they get to find the right water temperature, the right oxygen content, because as the water heats up, we lose oxygen levels in the water, right? So the more important it becomes for those fish to find the most oxygen and the cooler water temps, the more bigger the schools are gonna get in those conditions. So now we're looking at an extended period of time where you have bigger schools of fish. And we are starting to see some sure enough mega schools on the electronics out here on the offshore structure. They're not all there yet. They're not all positioned right yet. So every day, it's not like you're going out there every day and whacking them, even if you know where the schools are. There are definitely schools that you pull up on that aren't positioned right on the structure. They're a little too scattered. They're not quite down on it. And, and you just can't catch them. But there are moments where it shows up and shows out. And uh, Lee Livesey had one of those moments. I believe it was yesterday. If you follow Lee Livesey on Instagram, which everybody knows who Lee Livesey is at this point. He's won two Bassmaster Elite Series. He's the best fisherman on this lake over the last five years. Uh, he's back home. He didn't fish the Classic. He wasn't qualified, but he, uh, he's been back home for a few days, and it didn't take him long to figure out. Of course, he's going to be the first one to figure out where the mega schools are. And some of the stuff that he's doing, if you're not following him on Instagram, go follow it because it's absolutely insane. Like, we're not doing that in my boat. <laughs> like, we're catching some fish. We ain't doing that in my boat. But, I mean, he was doubled up on like eight. It looked like it would be like eight, nine pounders yesterday where his customers were doubled up on him at the same time, and, and they just caught a bunch of big fish on a big jig. But mm. what I'm trying to say, I'm doing what I do, which is ramble and talk forever. That's what I do. What I'm trying to say is don't give up on it just because it's getting a little difficult to find them. These fish are starting to school up in bigger numbers. And what that's gonna mean is that you're gonna have a higher percentage of the lake that's dead water. The more fish are in schools, the bigger the schools are, the more the lake that has zero. Does that make sense? So you need to get out there and grind them till you find them. Cause when you do find them, it's some of the most special fishing you'll ever see. I mean, I take the month of August off for guidance so I can have time to hang out with my kids before they go to school and all that. But I also still fish during August, even though I'm not guiding, because it's when you when you collide with those schools, it's insane. It's absolutely crazy. So it's a good time. Some good techniques. Obviously, offshore fishing is going to be key. You can still go shallow and catch fish on Lake Fork year round, like always. Uh, the biggest key to finding shallow fish when it gets hot, hot like this to me is you need to get to those fish that don't have a deep option. You need to get so far back in the massive grass flats and the massive shallow areas where those fish have to travel a mile to get to. 12, 15 foot of water. A lot of those fish are gonna be residential. Shallow fish are gonna stay back there all year. They're never gonna leave. They've got bait back there. The bait's not traveling either. And you can still get into those areas, but you need to go extreme. The weather's extreme, you need to go extreme. You need to go extremely far back in the biggest shallow flat creeks, or you need to go out on the main lake and, and get the deepest water with structure near the deepest water that you can. Humps and ledges are a big deal right now. Brush piles, have become a really key piece of structure for me. And one thing about brush piles on Lake Fork is crappie. Crappie love brush piles this time of year on Lake Fork. And I'm not crappie fishing. We're not going to break into a crappie seminar. Nobody get up and leave just yet. But the big bass on this lake love to eat crappie. And so brush piles have become a very key structure component for me this week. And when you're fishing different types, I'm saying structure, I mean cover. Um, when you're fishing different types of cover, the most important thing you can do is really fish baits and techniques that you can fish efficiently within that cover. So if we're fishing a more open water road bed or point, man, that, that opens the door. We can, we can crank it, we can throw a flutter spoon, we can throw swim baits on jig heads, we can throw Alabama rigs, Carolina rigs, shaky heads. You can throw it all on a wide open piece of water, right? If you're in standing timber, Man, you can pitch a big jig, you can throw a three quarter ounce jig in there. You can even run those swim baits on jig heads and kind of weave in between the timber um, and get lucky like that. You can throw a Carolina rig in there. You can throw a lot of things in standing timber on this lake right now. But when you get into a brush pile, there's only a few options, really, to, to fish it efficiently without getting hung up a bunch. You go to throw a Carolina rig in a brush pile, you're going to stay hung up. Uh, you can crank them with the right crankbaits. The six cents deep diving crankbaits deflect really well. I will bang those off there. Like if I'm seeing fish in there, I can't get them to bite. I'll hit a crankbait on that brush pile sometimes, but you're still gonna hang those up quite a bit. Swim bait on a jig head, forget about it, it's done. 
Like, so just wave bye-bye to it as soon as you throw it into that brush ball. The best bait, my favorite bait, and one of the best baits forever and ever on Lake Fork has been a big 10 inch or bigger ribbon tail worm on a light Texas rig in a brush pile. Whether it's, whether it's a brush pile or standing timber that still has a bunch of branches on it, if you're fishing heavy wood cover, a light Texas rig with a big ribbon tail worm is, I mean, since the beginning of time on this lake, it's one of the most productive baits you can throw. And, you know, we talk about six cents a lot on this channel, but with good reason. They're very innovative. They make great products. So they've actually brought some innovation to the ribbon tail worm game, which is, I mean, it's the oldest technique in bass fishing, I think. I mean, that's the original bass fishing techniques, plastic worms, you know, and ribbon tails were right there in the beginning. So um, to have something that's new and innovative and a different look is pretty, pretty outstanding on their part came out with this bait last year it's called a ridge worm now i pulled these packs off the shelf so if y'all want them you got to go down there and buy them off the shelf right you can also order them at sixcentsfishing.com if you're watching online and if you do order anything at sixcentsfishing.com what do they need to do cody type in your lake fork guide punch in that discount code your lake fork guide you'll save 10 percent on anything you order but as you can see with this worm it's very unique most ribbon tail worms are like body down to here and then they've got like a curled up tail that unfolds when it swims through the water it's a different look it's got a flat tail, a flat skinny tail, and this whole tail swims and the length, of, I mean, that much of the worm is all tail. So there's a lot more swimming action on this worm, even though it's a straight tail and not a curled up tail. It's just a different look. It's a very unique look. And on a pressured lake like Lake Fork, in all of our East Texas fisheries, really, uh, having a different look can make, how many of you have experienced whether you just randomly do something on Lake Fork and all of a sudden it catches them? everybody's raising their hands right yeah like having a little different look on a traditional technique can be such a big deal on this pond and that that ridge worm has really been the best deal in my boat lately so i want to talk to you guys tonight about how to fish this ridge worm in brush had a guy this morning that i've actually fished with a few times but we he's been with me in the springtime we've never really fished summer conditions and offshore structure or anything like that together and, and and old james man he loves fishing he get he's fun to fish with because he gets ex, he gets as excited about every fish catch as anybody that i ever fish with he gets even it doesn't matter two pounder one pounder three it doesn't matter he gets super excited about every fish catch but the reality is james doesn't have just a tremendous amount of experience in bass fishing he kind of started later in life in this game and he's not he's good at some things but then there's things that he's clueless about and he threw that ridge worm out there today and was reeling it in and i'm like what are you doing He's like, well, it's like a ribbon tail worm. You swim a, you swim a ribbon tail worm because it's got a swimming tail. I'm like, no, that's not really how you want to do it. And I don't say that to make fun of James, but I say that to say that there's a lot of people out there probably watching this that don't have a clue. Even though this is one of the more simpler techniques, rod positioning, sensitivity, being able to feel bites, being able to feel the difference between the brush ball and the bite is all very important. And then there's the aspect of knowing when to swing. Because when that fish bites and pulls you down into the brush, you have to know when to set the hook on him and sometimes when to wait to set the hook on him to let him get out of that brush before you swing and then he's hung up in the brush ball, you can't get him. And if he gets hung up in the brush, you got to know how to play him out. So we're going to cover all that tonight. As far as the brush piles go, I mean, it's really simple. You want, basically, I like to set up about 40 feet away from a brush pile. So what I do is I have my front graph set up on a, where I've got a, what do they call that thing down at the bottom where you can see how far it is? Range, range. Mm -hmm. They're not range rings, but there's like a range scale down on the bottom, scale. down on the bottom where you got like this little, and it shows you, okay, well that wide, that's 50 feet, and it's down on the bottom right hand corner of your map. So I'll get just inside of that and spot lock. So now I'm about 40 feet away from the brush pile. And you're gonna be able to cast, anybody's gonna be able to cast about 60 feet. Really, if you bomb it, you can cast 70, 80 feet with a Texas rig, no problem. And for brush pile fishing, guys, before I go any further, I'm rigging this up on a quarter ounce or an eighth ounce Texas rig, depending on the wind. Here lately, you can throw it on an eighth ounce. It just depends on how far you can cast an eighth ounce. Quarter ounce is a little easier to cast, or if it's a little more windy, throw the quarter ounce on it so you can feel it in the wind. But I like to rig it up on a light Texas rig. That's gonna be key. You rig it up on a three eighth ounce or a half ounce, that worm is gonna get down in there and dig down in that brush pile more, and it's gonna be more prone to get hung up. And the last thing you wanna do on a brush pile is get your worm hung up and have to go get on top of a brush pile in 12 or 15 or even 20 feet of water. You don't wanna go get right on top of them. How many people think fishing in 20 foot of water is fishing deep water? few people raised their hand and said yes okay when you're standing on your bass boat and you're up there right by the trolling motor and you turn around and look at that outboard is that far 
Is it far? From your trolling motor to your outboard, it's not very far, right? That's 20 feet of water. That's, that's 20 feet. That's 20 feet. But we think that's, we think that's deep water. Well, I run the FXR20 because I like to go fast. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but that's 20 feet. So it's really not as deep as you think it is. Now, you take a fish that's this big, which that's a pretty good, that's a pretty decent fish right there. I don't get upset about catching that fish right there. There's a fish this big and you're gonna put your entire boat on top of him 20 feet above his head. That's not good. You don't wanna do that. So we don't wanna get hung up. So quarter ounce Texas rig, 20 pound fluorocarbon. I'm typically using a four rod EWG hook on this ridge worm. I, I like EWG hooks for brush piles. I normally like to use straight shank hooks when I'm fishing any type of soft plastic. I like to use a straight shank hook if I can get away with it. Your hookup ratio is better. Your hang up ratio in a brush pile is gonna be better too if you use a straight shank hook. I like EWG hooks for specifically fishing brush piles. Uh, they're a much more weedless option. So I'm gonna get 40 feet away. I'm gonna cast it out to about 60 feet. Let the worm go all the way to the bottom. I'm gonna drag up to the brush pile and start climbing it. Now, when I say drag, I'm gonna throw out there and I'm gonna hold my rod just like this. And I'm gonna drag from six to 12 straight up. Just like that. That is gonna give me the most sensitivity in my rod tip. That's gonna let me feel every bump, every branch, any bite that I might get, no matter how subtle, I'm gonna feel it a lot better dragging it from six to 12. And then I'm gonna point my rod down from 12 and reel up my slack. I never wanna move that bait with my reel handle, never. I only wanna pick up slack or reel in a fish. That's it, that's the only thing a reel handle's there for on this technique. I'm also going to peg this, by the way, if I didn't say that earlier, I don't think I said that, did I? Mm -mm. You gotta peg it when you're fishing a brush pile. Cause if you drag it up there and that weight falls over that branch and your worm's back here, you're hung up. So you gotta peg it right down to the worm when you're fishing brush. Drag it and, and you don't wanna shake it or impart any action, even though that ribbon tail worm, man, it's great to put the action on the bait, right? And if I was fishing it on the shaky head on a roadbed, yeah, I'd shake it. I wanna get that ribbon tail going. But you don't wanna do that when you're fishing brush. The brush is gonna put the action on the bait for you. You're gonna climb the first limb and, it, and when it falls, you're gonna drop your rod tip. And that bait's gonna climb up, get hung a little bit, pop, fall down, and that ribbon tail is gonna kick all the way down. And then as you're picking it up and it's drifting in that water and that wind current, it's gonna sit there and kind of swim at them. And then when it hits the next one and falls down, it's gonna swim real hard again. So you don't put any action on the bait, you just drag it. It's a slow technique. It's hot, these fish are hot. They're, 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 they're suffering, you know what I mean? Like, they're uncomfortable. They're getting uncomfortable in 90 degree water. It's very important for them to feed efficiently and not waste any energy. So you wanna fish this technique as slow as you can through that brush in order to give that fish the most opportunity to have it right in his face. He does not want to have to chase anything when it's that hot. Because it's all about a, a risk reward, a math equation of these fish this time of year where is this meal worth the energy that I'm gonna use to eat it? So you wanna make that energy output as low as possible by keeping it in his face as long as possible and that's it guys you're just going to drag it through the brush one piece at a time and really make sure you're keeping that worm in that brush pile as long as possible once you're out of the brush and you don't feel the brush anymore reel in throw back out there again just keep it in that brush pile if you've marked a brush pile and especially if you've marked a brush pile and you've marked fish around it you need to fit you need to fish that brush pile for 30 minutes at least a lot of times on lake fork especially with the pressure again the boat traffic when you idle around that brush pile and you hit spot lock and that, you know, when you first hit spot lock, it's like zzz, 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 till it locks in, right? You're making noise. That fish hears all that noise. He hears your, your sonars pinging. Let them get used to you being there. Let them settle back into that brush before you give up on it. You know, a lot of times we mark fish, we make five casts in there and we're like, okay, they're not biting, let's go to the next one. I hear you. But if you got anywhere near them, especially on a pressured lake, you need to give them some time. If you mark fish in there, they're gonna come back to it. Just give them some time. Drag through that brush real slow. When you get a bite, when you get a bite, don't set the hook. <laughs> everybody wants to set the hook when they get a bite. Uh, well, not everybody, but a lot of people, and James did it this morning too, the first couple bites he missed because he drag up and he go thunk and he do that. It's not what you want to do. When you get a bite on Texas rig and you're dragging six to 12, you want to drop that rod tip, feed that fish slack, slowly reel up your slack, feel for that fish, make sure he's got the bait, number one, but also make sure you're not in the brush pile. And this is gonna take some time on the water. There's no replacement for time on the water. But when you can feel, when that fish is running with your bait and you can feel the difference between just a fish or a fish with your line around some brush, that's when you're gonna get really good at fishing brush piles. Because there are times, there was, 
There was one this morning that as he pulled my bait down, I could feel my line rubbing on that brush. And so I just kind of kept easing with him. I even pushed my button and fed him line, eat, letting him go, letting him go, letting him go. And then eventually he was swimming away because they eat and they swim out of that brush pile every time. They don't want to be in there when they're trying to eat. Like they'll eat something and then go out of it. He finally went out of it far enough to where I felt, okay, now my line's out of the brush. It's just fish. Now I set the hook, reel the fish in, no problem. There's going to be times when you set the hook on one and he's going to swim into the brush or you're going to pull him into the brush and he's going to get hung up. And the biggest mistake that I see people make when they're, when they're fighting fish that's hung up in brush or wood is they want, to, they want to pull them through it. You know what I mean? Like you'll set the hook and you pull him and you're just trying to pull him through it and you pull him as hard as you can. That's really the worst thing you can do because what you're going to do is you're going to peg that fish's head against a piece of wood and now every time he shakes, he has all the leverage in the world to rip that hook out. And then you're going to have a ripped out hook that gets hung in the brush because it's exposed. And you're going to go, man, I lost the fish or man, did I even have a fish, whatever. So when you set that hook and you feel that fish get pinned up in something, as soon as you feel him get locked up and pinned up, this is a touchy thing too that takes experience as well. But you want to let off of that fish without letting your rod tip go straight. So if I set the hook and my rod tip is bowed up all the way, what I want to do is let my rod kind of unfold without straightening up and just let enough tension off where that fish has the opportunity to swim away from that brush or that timber. They want to get away. They don't want to be pinned up next to that tree. They're going to try to swim away. And when they swim away, let them swim away a little bit and then pull. And a lot of times your line will pop off. But if it doesn't, pull them up again. They lock up again. Let them swim away again. I have done this as many as 10 or 15 times on one fish before the line finally comes free and then I just reel him in. I had one get locked up on brush this morning that was there and I had to do it at least three or four, maybe five times where I would pull him up to the brush, he'd lock up and I'd let him swim back away, never letting my rod go all the way straight. Always keeping the line tight, but not also not just bulldogging him into the brush, letting him get away from it. That's a huge, huge component between landing a really big fish and losing a really big fish. So many people, almost everybody that I fish with, wants to pull on that fish as hard as they can to try and get it through that brush or that wood. They're like trying to pull him around the corner of it or something. Nine times out of ten, it's not going to work. You're going to peg that fish. He's going to rip the hook out, and you're going to lose. So let that fish swim away from the brush. It's really important. Um, as far as colors go, today, plum apple was hands down the best color in our boat. Or, well, this one's actually called plum bug. This is a six-inch ridge worm. This is plum bug. A lot of plastic colors, a lot of plastic brands call it plum apple and then blue fleck this one again it's called plum fleck both of these are available downstairs there's only two packages left of this this was my best color today so you might want to get you one of the two packages that's downstairs you'll hear you have there you go sold to the lowest bidder right there there we go uh plum fleck has been a really good color for me lately as well all of these red purplish plum colors are going to be really good what's up bryce hmm. you want well you got to buy them though so these aren't giveaways. These belong to Lake Fork Marine, so you got to buy them. Probably some. Tell Daddy to stop being cheap. Get them for you. <laughs> Bryce, does Daddy need to buy these? Hey. There you go. Sold to Vic right there. There it is. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> you should go fishing with him. That is he great. He tells you how to fish while you're fishing. I bet he does. He does. It he is, does. It's very intense. I wonder where he gets that from <laughs> uh-huh you gotta teach them right to start out yeah you raise them right and, and whatever we do just don't raise them left and he's on my butt that's right <laughs> 10 seconds of liberal tears here we go